Okay, Ashley Banks and Harrison 2.0 giving us that Holly Jolly vibe. I love how it's the same actors playing themselves from 15 years before, giving us that real black don't crack energy. And Tatiana Ali is making sure we know she had pipes, okay? Hey y'all, it's your girl Naspi and welcome back to Nasmus 2018. Today I'll be reviewing the Lifetime original Jingle Bell. Our accompanying cocktail today is called a gingerbread eggnog. Full disclosure, I didn't use all the ingredients, but it wasn't because I was substituting this time. It's because the brand of eggnog that I bought already had whiskey and rum and all these other things in it. If I added the vodka, your girl probably wouldn't have been in the right space to finish recording, much less edit this video. So of course, based on the name, eggnog is involved. If you're not a fan, you can skip that part of the recipe or just skip this cocktail altogether. I have several others that you can go back and try to make again. Of course, I'll be listing the recipe in the description below for you to try your hand if you want. If you do, tell me how it turns out and I hope you enjoy. The plot of Jingle Bell reads, Every year, Isabel, Tatiana Ali, and her high school sweetheart, Mike, Cornelius Smith Jr., rocks their small town's annual Christmas Eve pageant with a sweet Christmas duet. But after graduation, Isabel left to study at Juilliard in New York, leaving Mike behind. Years later, when Isabel returns to her hometown to write music for the annual Christmas Eve pageant, she's shocked to learn that Mike is the one directing the show. Can Isabel and Mike put the past behind them and reunite on stage for another show-stopping duet? So a couple of things about that. We only see them performing once at presumably one of the concerts, even though they played the same footage over and over again. And the duet that they end up performing at the end of the show was actually not show-stopping at all. Sorry, spoiler, no spoiler. But I get how blurbs work. They're supposed to get people interested and they're supposed to pack a punch. So I'll let it pass. So let me start with what I liked about it. I liked the title of the movie. It's actually a play on a nickname that she has. And it wasn't simply, oh, we're gonna call her Bell, short for Isabel and Jingle because of Christmas. She's actually a jingle writer. So there are levels to this kind of pun. And I'm a girl who loves puns, so thumbs up for that. I also like the establishing shots. They help to give a warm and cozy and merry feeling to this movie. And I think my favorite character was Tori, played by Keisha Knight Pulliam, AKA Rudy Huxtable. She plays Isabel's younger sister and she's actually the person who sets things in motion for Isabel to come back home. There's actually a small scene with her that stands out for me in terms of showing how good she was in her role. It's when Isabel and Michael come home with her, Tori's son, and just the way she greets them and then how she reacts later when she kind of sort of interrupts a certain moment, it felt so effortless and realistic. So essentially for this movie, Belle goes home to find her heart. So she ends up discovering that her heart was indeed at home in Ohio and more than that with Michael, despite her denying for so long. It's a typical plot and resolution with Christmas themed movies. You know what you're signing up for when you decide to watch these, so I won't mark it down for lack of originality. How However, I feel like it could have been so much better if they did more showing and less telling. One of the significant things that I got from this movie from them showing versus telling, even though they did end up telling us, was that this was a small town with a lot of people who loved and cared about each other. As for Belle and Michael's love story and their entire history, I had to take the words of the people in the movie. It was stated by several of them that the two of them were really in love and both of them were broken up when they had to separate. However, I didn't see any of that. Folks alluded to there being unfinished business between these two, and I wish that was something that was brought home in how the actors portrayed the characters. I will say though that Michael was more convincing, and I guess him being the one that was left behind and thinking of Belle as the one that got away helped him in that regard. I didn't get any impression from Belle though that she was missing anything or longing for anyone. Before she returned home, her sole interest seemed to be her job and trying to break through her writer's block. And it wasn't a case where it seemed like she was a workaholic busying herself to distract from something else. She just didn't seem to be interested in anything or anyone else. And after she returned home, I still didn't get the impression that she saw Michael again and it was like, oh, I've been missing this person, I've been missing this thing. So this is obviously supposed to be a second chance romance. And for a show that's supposed to be about the second time around, they could have improved their timing and pacing. Their scenes could have been spliced or synced better. And also the conversations felt like they were 
kind of messily glued together i don't know how to explain it i tried to come up with a good analogy just know that i feel like the jigsaw puzzle the edges didn't quite fit smoothly and this issue with the conversations really comes to a head at the end of the film there's a big declaration that michael makes minutes before he makes this declaration he seems pretty resigned to the fact that bell is leaving and not in a sense that oh i'm so sorry that i missed out he just seems like oh yeah it's whatever they mentioned before that he didn't fight for her the first time around he didn't seem to have any intention this time and then he goes from being pretty blase about her to saying something about not being able to live without her or something i don't remember the words i just know the moment felt kind of clunky to me and it just didn't resonate and what made it even worse after he said that in this public space in front of everybody and she's there she doesn't seem affected by it at all she just stares at him and i guess makes some kind of contemplative face it was not confused it just was not one that made it seem like she was really into it or she felt anything and then the next morning christmas morning she has decided to stay and he comes over later and that's when he finds out and my thing is wouldn't they have spoken about this the night before after that big kiss on stage? Especially since he assumed she was going to leave. And if it was that she said, hey, I'm not going to leave, why would he ask her about it the next day? You see what I mean? They could have just made it fit together more smoothly. And as for her sticking around, they gave us a plausible and acceptable enough reason. But I do wish that he was the one who had left his life behind to go and be where she was. Whether it's some big shot successful woman ending up with a regular man or some regular woman who ends up with a prince is always the woman who uproots her life. And in this, we do have Michael say a couple of times that he's thinking about going to New York to be with Belle. But thinking about something is not the same as doing it. And him thinking about it wasn't enough to subvert the trope. And I don't want to be nitpicky, but there are a couple of things that logistics-wise just didn't add up to me or just plain seemed silly. So a main source of conflict ends up being how the song that they wrote for the Christmas Eve concert ends up being taken by her boss to be used as a jingle. Isabel and Michael act as if it's a foregone conclusion that the song has been sold as a jingle. And this is even after mentioning that they need Michael to sign off on it. It just didn't add up because he was acting as if he was powerless in a situation where it was stated that he had majority or basically all of the power. And the next thing that made me raise my eyebrows was when the mayor sent them an email. I had to pause, rewind and screenshot because what? Who sends an email like that? Especially a public elected official. <laughs> Guys, come on. So all in all, I'd give this movie a slightly above average rating, somewhere between 6 and 7. Or maybe I'd just leave it at 7 if I'm feeling generous. You know, the Christmas spirit. I think it's a pretty decent watch and if these are your kinds of movies, you'll be happy that you checked it out. With all that said, I want to thank you so much for watching. Hit that thumbs up button if you haven't yet. Subscribe if you want to know when I release new content. Share this everywhere and I will see you in the next video. Bye.